rather startling. Uh, do you want to talk a bit about publishing before we go on to some substantive things? Um, all right, I, I think I have some comments to make, but let, let me hear some of your questions and the kinds of things that you want to know. I think it's absolutely clear that for those of us who want an academic career, who want a career in, at a university and so forth, and so forth, publishing is, is very, very important. Uh, there have been some uh, attempts at um, uh, lightening that uh, emphasis on publish versus publish or perish, but I still think um, most people recognize that uh, careers in academia are very, very strongly uh, determined by uh, <coughs> one's research record and, and one's uh, publishing record. Uh, what are some of the comments that you have or questions about <coughs> publishing in journals and stuff like that? The first question about the uh, argument whatever between getting a, a good publication and a JQ or something mm -hmm. like that as opposed to getting several lesser publications, <laughs> whatever. And what's your opinion on that? Well, I'm, I watched how lots of different <laughs> departments in both um, sociology and criminal justice, and in fact, I try to do something more systematic by looking at how other uh, fields have treated this. How important is the prestigious journal versus quantity, which is really what you're asking. For example, there are some departments um, in terms of tenure decisions or promotion decisions generally say, well, we discount textbooks and we discount non-peer review uh, articles and we discount um, book reviews, etc. Well, the only thing that we're looking at, and then we give brownie points among those categories, are publications in peer-reviewed journals and in terms of book length things, um, a university press is more important or gets more brownie points than a commercial uh, publisher and that within the uh, peer-reviewed journals there are those who are those journals which are very important those are not. Um, it seems to me that if you um, have something to say and if you have some useful important data and so forth the important thing is to get it out because once it's out, even if it may not be in the first rank journal, it has a way of being picked up. It may not simply disappear and getting reprinted other places and getting cited. And the citations are almost as important as the um, article itself in terms of people hearing about it, knowing about it. In fact, there are jokes about uh, how some unpublished papers um, took on a life of their own and became very important uh, long before there was anything uh, published on, on those topics, simply because the people would talk about it a lot and other people would comment about it. Uh, I'm, one of the best examples of that is um, Olin and Cloward's opportunity theory. They talked about it for years at various meetings and, and their students uh, would leave Columbia, that's when they were both at uh, Columbia School of Social Work and go off and hold uh, positions at other universities and everyone was talking about opportunity theory much, much before it was published. It became an important and serious uh, uh, piece of work and so on, really through the oral tradition. But I think the, the, the more general point is um, if you have something to say, don't give up because, or don't throw the manuscript in the waste paper basket or in one of your desk drawers because it didn't, uh, wasn't accepted by criminology or justice quarterly or something like that. Publish it wherever you can. Uh, I think that's much more important. Uh, kind of a follow up to that. In the position that we're in right now, I'm looking at, I mean, I want some publications before I get out. Obviously. Okay. Good yeah. job. Yes. But I'm mean, looking at it, I can either wait, I can submit it to or something like that, wait for their six months or whatever to review it. Maybe they turn it down and I have to turn around and go somewhere else as opposed to putting it out to, to a lesser publication that may print it right away. And there's another strategy which I'm amazed that given 
some of the experience I've had in public speaking, I didn't know about until a few months ago. Now, you, Professor Del Carmen, I'm sure are aware of this, that you can submit the same article to 100 law reviews at the same time. I never knew that. I'm, I, I who have, have submitted articles to law reviews and have worked with lawyers and law students, <coughs> in all my years of working with Jeffrey O'Connell and all my years of uh, even Fred Marshall, who's on the federal bench now, etc., we've published together, none of them ever said to me, you know, it's different, it, probably because they didn't realize what it was like in the social sciences, um, that, that you had to wait. It was all, you know, you wait for one, you get the rejection, you send it off to the other, etc. Um, and so one of the things that I've learned now is it's opened up a whole new world to me. I'm working on some papers with some of my law students at AU, and we have sent out four articles to about um, 30 journals, 30 law reviews. I think that's marvelous. Now, of course, you can do that in, um, in book-length manuscripts. You send out the same manuscript to many different things, many different uh, publishers. In um, terms of the quick turnaround, I can tell you that when I was editor of JQ, and I tried my damnedest also when I was editor of ASR, to try and cut that turnaround time, because I think that's really one of the worst things. I tried to get people um, their reviews and, and my decisions in two, two and a half months. I, I'll tell you where the roadblock comes. It doesn't come at the editor's desk. It comes with the reviewers. Uh, you tell them two weeks, three weeks at the most, you phone them, you write them letters, etc. Uh, they promise, it's the classic, the check is in the mail thing, etc. Really, uh, it is the reviewers. And then, of course, when you get the reviews, if there's disagreement among the two, sometimes you write and tell the author that, and you make a decision. You say, well, I'm going to um, suggest that you revise and resubmit and focus on this review, pay less attention to this one. But very often the editor, when he gets or she gets two reviews, will say, wait a minute, before I contact the author, I'm going to send it out again. Now, the author may not even know that, and therefore that will take longer. Um, I'm of two minds on that. There, first of all, I'm generally very impatient, and I, I hate the long wait. So there are many times in my career when I said, I don't care. I want the piece out. I'm going to send it to, one, a journal, which I think there's a much greater likelihood that it will publish it, and two, that it will appear quickly. There are many journals that don't know how they will fill their next issue. And uh, so when they get a good piece, they expedite it, and it, it appears in six months, whereas there's, sometimes there's a backlog, and uh, your piece won't appear for two years. And there's some kinds of issues, there's some kinds of topics where time matters. And I wouldn't wait again for the, the top journal. One, because of less certainty, and two, because um, it may be that what you have to say in getting it out now will arouse some further interest in the topic, more research, etc. It may be worth it. That's, that, that's a call that you want to think about long and hard and, and ask somebody more senior in the field. But I wouldn't take a standard rule of I try for the best journal and I go down the line. Once that journal rejects it, then I go to the next one. I wouldn't. I, I would sample within uh, those rankings and make my decision more on where I am in my own career, what, it, what kind of issue and topic I'm dealing with, uh, and then make the decision. Let's say you're working on your dissertation and you're you may have a number of good publishable articles, right. or you may have a good book by the time it's all through. Which would weigh more, which would be the better option? More articles or one? It doesn't have to be an either or. You can do both. You can publish some articles uh, on your dissertation, and then when the dissertation, that fa in fact happens very often, and then when, you, when the book is published, you say uh, these chapters have appeared <coughs> in. Uh, um, article form and using these journals. That happens very often, in, even not in dissertations, but by the time people get around to publishing a book, they have already published bits and pieces of what it is they're working on in journals. And it's perfectly acceptable. As an editor, what do you look at as far as accepting the type of I mean, what, what way do you give Okay. I've written several articles. In fact, a former student of mine, Vaughn Buchanan, did her PhD dissertation on editing ASR because I gave her all my notes and everything. And we have since had several articles accepted, one of them in ASR on publishing and editing 
uh, and, um, on com- and then I had an article on the complaint process to the editor, and I had another article on what happens to revise and resubmitted manuscripts and so forth. Uh, one of the things that is very important to understand is the kind of journal it is and the power of the editor. I had a sign up in my ASR office. I think I, I didn't put it up in the JQ office because, well, you'll see in a minute. The article said, um, it's not my journal uh, when I was editing ASR. And what did I mean by that? ASR was the official journal of the American Sociological Association. I know Justice Quarterly is the official journal of the Academy of Criminal Justice Sciences. The editor of uh, an official journal has much less power than, say, Norman Podhuritz has in editing uh, commentary or the people who edit uh, New Republic or The Nation, etc. Um, those kinds of editors are what you, the layperson thinks of as the editor. He or she, in her wisdom, sits there and says, this is a fine article. It's really important. It's on a subject that matters. I want the world to know about it. I'm going to publish it tomorrow. Um, the editor of an official journal really doesn't have that kind of power. He or she is very much dependent on peer review. I always um, bent over backwards. I am going to answer your question, but I think this history may be useful. I always bent over backwards to send out practically everything that came into the office. I would look at everything, and my deputy editors would look at things, and except if the article was really a speech, or if it was just off the wall, uh, it really had nothing to do with uh, justice, or nothing to do with sociology or something, a political speech or anything, or something like that, uh, we would send it out. So in fact, we sent out over 90% of all the manuscripts that came in. That means we sent it out for the author's peers to review. And and when I was editing ASR, we were getting 700 manuscripts a year. 90% of them were sent out. Okay. When the manuscript came back, after it was reviewed, um, then I would read the manuscript carefully, and... um, I would read the reviewers' comments. My deputy editors often just read the reviewers' comments, or they would read um, uh, manuscripts that they were particularly interested in. They didn't necessarily read them all, but I did. My policy was that if both authors, if both reviewers damn the manuscript, the data are no good, the reasoning is fallacious, there's no theory to it, um, you know, that kind of thing, almost always. 95% of the time, I would agree with them. I I did have one or two instances in which I disagreed. If both our reviewers said the manuscript was very good and recommended publishing, uh, my rate of agreement wasn't that high. If I thought, well, but I think there's something wrong here, or I'm curious about this, very often I would send it out again. If the reviewers disagreed, in about half the cases, I would make the decision and decide uh, and be the third vote or I I would send it out. What I said in my opening uh, comments, uh, which I think were published in both ASR and Justice Quarterly, is that I'm not so concerned with elegance. Um, One of the things that I I think has happened to economics is that they have become terribly concerned with elegance, that uh, mathematics and models and so forth are driving the discipline. And every, if, if it's not really elegant, if the modeling isn't just terrific, uh, the chances of it getting published in a mainstream economics journal is very slim. Well, that was somewhat the direction I thought that ASR was going when I took it over. Just as clearly, I was the first editor, so um, we were starting fresh there. And what I said was, I'm particularly interested in papers that are on topics and issues that matter. I think things have to be important. And I think that there is a difference between trivia and important issues. And I think no matter how much you dress up a basically unimportant problem or issue with all kinds of statistical models and all kinds of formula and so forth, if in the end it doesn't really matter, I would be loath to publish it. Not all editors agree with that. But that was basically my position, that I wanted to find 
problems and areas that mattered. And I didn't have any um, preferences for what the subject, for example, in ASR, for what the subject matter was. People had felt that before some of the previous editors had uh, downplayed <coughs> certain subfields within sociology, that it was very difficult to get into ASR if you were working on deviance or criminology or some softer, quote, softer areas. And I said that's simply not the case. And in fact, I would take articles, even if there were other specialty journals, like demography, um, that dealt exclusively with uh, population and demographic problems. I said, look, if it's of general enough interest, even though the, the subtopic happens to be demography, if it's of general interest to sociologists, why not publish it in ASR? So that I looked the top for manuscripts that mattered, and I didn't give any special preferences to uh, subfields or specialties and so forth. When I was editing Justice Quarterly, I also looked for manuscripts that mattered. I think I said that I would probably, there were other outlets for manuscripts about the teaching of criminal justice and justice issues, and therefore we would not turn the pages of Justice Quarterly over to that orientation. But in terms of areas of research, uh, substantive fields, there wasn't anything, there wasn't any issue or any topic that I said was closed to uh, the pages of Justice Quarter. Does that answer your question? Yes. Is there a the person doesn't have that PhD I know technically it's not supposed to be, but does that make a difference? Well, it's certainly in terms of the peer reviews, it makes no difference because they don't know. Every manuscript in every Justice Quarterly ASR, indeed in all the sociology journals and in criminology and in Justice Quarterly and I think in a lot of the other criminology type journals, manuscripts are sent out blind so that you don't know who. And you really try to do a good job on that. That is, you go through the references and you try and, and cut out um, ways of identifying there and even in the manuscript itself. So it isn't that you simply cut out the, the name of the author. So there it doesn't matter. Um, in terms of my own experience as editor, it made not one bit of difference. In fact, uh, one of the things that happens to you as editor is that you end up writing rejection letters to some of the most eminent people in the field. Uh, because you, of course, know who they are. So no, it does not matter at all. I guess that's one difference between uh, publishing in, 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 in the kind of social science journal. I mean, the law journal, the law journal generally They're not. No, I've published in law review at, on my own. In Did fact, as a, in law school? No, as a graduate student uh, at Chicago, when I was only in sociology, I published in Ohio State Law Journal, and in, and when I was at, uh, and I published in Stanford Law Review, when I was just in sociology. No, I've published alone in law reviews. Um, I thought what you were going to say is that, uh, of course, law reviews don't very often don't th send things out anonymously. And, and don't send things out. It's decided um, in a, right there among the editors. And in economics, for example, things are not sent out anonymously. So this is not a, an across-the-board view. So some t in some fields it does matter. But in, to the best of my knowledge, in any of the criminology, criminal justice journals, unless some of you know differently, I think they're all sent out anonymously. And that's true in sociology. So I, I strongly urge you to uh, to try and send things out. And um, I also want to tell you that uh, everybody gets rejections. Don't think that, don't attribute it to the fact that you're a graduate student or where you're writing it from or something like that uh, or some other aspect of your ascriptive status. Everybody gets rejections. Um, well, some of us get more than others, but nevertheless, it, it's extraordinary. First of all, it's a function of how much you write. Uh, if you write a great deal, you're simply going to get more rejections. Then there, there, there are various strategies for this. I know some senior uh, people in, in the social sciences, for example, who, who really find a rejection very painful. And so they have a strategy that is self-preserving, and that is 
that they hardly ever send anything out. That's a very good way of not getting rejections. No, I'm serious. That if, if it's painful, and to some people it's devastating, and some reviewers... Oh, here's, here's another thing. I never censored what the reviewers said to the author. And some reviewers, I think, are crude. Some reviewers uh, are heartless. Some reviewers uh, inflict a great deal of pain on authors, and I think it's not necessary to make that on tax on, on the author. They, they refer to the author as being ignorant, stupid, blah, 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 blah. It's not necessary. You can simply say uh, the author didn't cite some important study, or the author missed the point on this, or the author, I think, needs to understand regression better or something, without making these attacks. What I would do in my letter to the uh, rejected author was to try and explain what I thought was wrong with the paper, and I would often apologize for what I thought was the um, colorful language uh, that the reviewer used, but I wouldn't censor the reviewer's comments because I thought that was um, not the right thing to do. Um, But in terms of of rejections, uh, if it is that painful to you, and, and there are people for whom it is devastating, then you have to be very careful. And then that also can determine the quality of the journal you send it to. Because if you uh, send it to a journal that gets hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of manuscripts every year and can only publish, say, 50 or 40 a year, then obviously your chances of, of gaining acceptance are much smaller than if you send it to a journal that gets 150 submissions a year and can publish 55 of them. They have to publish something. Very, I, I know of no instance in which a journal said uh, we're only coming out a quarterly, for example, said we're only coming out two or three times this year because we don't have a, enough good manuscript. Somehow you scrape the bottom and you do. Um, and I think uh, if you read the articles, you can tell. But um, I think that's an, another kind of, of strategy. If you're saying, I want to get published, um, I would rather go with a journal, which is a greater likelihood, then you should know something about submission rates of journals. I think don't bother sending in a manuscript that's simply a review of the literature. I always say that to my students when they hand me in, hand in a seminar paper to me. Please don't just send, give me a, a review of the literature. In most instances, I think I know the literature as well as you. And secondly, I think you need to go beyond that. Um, I think you have to be careful about your sa- if it's an empirical piece. I think you have to be careful about the sample and to whom you can generalize in terms of whatever findings you have. If you've done a, a study in um, a small community in the United States, it may be on an important issue, um, but if it's limited to that particular community and you'd be very wary about generalizing people's responses in that community to any larger group of people. It may be a very carefully done study. You may have done everything right in terms of selecting your sample and analyzing your data and testing for significance. It's probably not going to be important enough. And so therefore, while it was an accessible um, study that you could have done, um, it's probably not going to get get published. I don't know how other people feel about it, but I get kind of nervous when I get outside with the use of the literature, like the paper I just did on Deadly Force. Mm-hmm. For one of the first times, I finally went out and said, okay, I, I've gathered all this information, now let me tell you what I think about it. Right. And I got into personal, you know, my view of yes. what's going on, right. but I was real conscientious about that. And I tried to always, every time I said something, back yeah. up to something somebody yes. else said. Yes. And yeah. So where do you, where do you That's a tough one. I think, I think that when you're writing a piece on a controversial topic, um, it's foolish um, not to say that you have a position. Um, but I think if you can support your position, either with the data that you have collected and analyzed, or if you can say, look, my data fits into this larger tradition, or indeed my data refute what seems to be the growing trend in this area, and I think these data are better 
than what has been collected earlier. And I think that we ought to think in terms of policies that are derivable from these stronger, better data, then I think you should do it. I think, again, uh, what I say to my students in seminars, I'm interested in all of your opinions. I, I would like, however, that when you voice your opinion, that you could at least indicate that it is based on uh, some empirical data set or uh, that there is some body of literature that is consistent with that. And while I understand that you feel very strongly about criminalization or decriminalization of drugs, uh, to simply say that in uh, very emotional tones without providing some support for it isn't very helpful. And I think that's even more the case uh, when you're uh, sending in something for publication. Is there a bias in, in, in say, the, say, JQ against the applied type of research and criminalization? That's a good question. Um, I think if it's completely applied with no theoretical basis, uh, its chances of getting published are not as good as a piece that either was mixed or that uh, was less applied. I think that's true. And I guess the argument would be there are journals that are devoted to applied work. Um, and that becomes, again, very complicated because if you're talking about things that matter, uh, applications can sometimes matter a hell of a lot more than um, not very well substantiated theory or some poorly derived uh, uh, hypotheses and so forth. So I think when people say applied, I think, again, they have to say, but look, it comes out of some tradition, or it has implications for some policy, etc. And I think it's looked at maybe a little bit more carefully, but it's not simply thrown out. It may have a harder road to hold it. Yes, yes, that matters. And very often a journal will tell you that at the beginning. I, I think the first month that I was editing ASR, I received a hundred-page manuscript from a very illustrious internationally known sociologist. And I simply packaged it right up and sent it back to him airmail and said, if you can cut it down to 30 type pages, send it back. I never heard of him. Um, <laughs> yeah, length matters. Now, it's not a hard and fast rule. I mean, if, when I said 30, if he had sent in 50 pages, we would have looked at it and not publish, even if we had agreed to publish, we probably would have insisted that he cut it, and that's one of the things that an editor gets very actively involved. If we're going to publish, we don't, we rarely publish what it is that is sent in without tampering with it. Not only the, the um, uh, cosmetic kind of copy editing, but we will say, look, that's a little redundant here, or I think we can take out this section, or why don't you save this for something else? Uh, but we'll consider it, so that length matters, uh, but it's a kind of flexible standard. A hundred pages, probably you'll get sent right back. Fifty pages, I'll say, well, it better be damn good, because that means we're going to have to invest a lot of time in it, because we probably won't publish the whole thing. How will we cut it? So, yes, length matters. Yeah. Cleanliness is the uh, um, It didn't matter to me, but I know it matters to some editors. I know when they get a piece that really looks terrible uh, and is full of typos and spelling errors and so forth, it annoys uh, some editors in Canada, and sometimes reviewers will make comments about it. Uh, I tried very hard not to allow it to influence me. Similarly, when you got manuscripts from people uh, for whom English was not their first language, that could be a problem because you're reading something and while you could somehow close your eyes and say, you know what the person is saying is really important and it's on a good topic. Nevertheless, it's so awkward to read uh, that it's hard not to allow that to influence you. I tried very hard not to allow it. In fact, one of the, some of the criticisms that I got was that I opened the doors of ASR to too many foreign scholars. But I again said, if it's important, if it matters, let's try and get it through and then let's 
really work with it. And I was very lucky in both my editing of ASR and JQ. I had terrific copy editors. They, they really did a very good job. And that's where a lot of the give and take between editor and author, because we'd send them the copy edited manuscript and say, this is, we wouldn't send them galleys, but we'd send them the copy edited manuscript and say, this is what we're doing with your manuscript. And this was their time to fight. And we used to have some fights about it. But not, not with galleys. Uh, along with publication, what do you do at uh, conferences? Are they as important or less important? Well, if anyone's looked at my Vita, you'd think I never attended a conference and I never wrote a book review. Uh, in fact, I've attended hundreds of conferences and given hundreds of papers. I don't put it on my Vita uh, and I don't put book reviews on my Vita. But there's enormous variation in that. Some people put every conference that they ever went to on their Vita. Some people put, you know, very often conferences uh, publish, conference proceedings. Uh, that goes on the Vita. Uh, every book review goes on the Vita. I don't do it. Um, and I'll tell you that my bias is, as dean and as a department chair and so forth, I've looked at many Vitas. When I start seeing one conference after another, some people put every TV appearance on. Uh, so they do. Uh, I say, oh well, what else is new? And then I start going down and saying, now where are the, the really published papers? And for me, I'm not saying for anybody else, it's a name. I can get, I say, damn padded readers, let's get down to it. But that's a personal reaction. And you will find in, throughout academia, not only in criminology or the social sciences, but across the field, you will see that people strike different bargains with themselves about what they put on their behalf. What about from our standpoint? Like, maybe I can't get some publications out. I think as a student, I think... Yeah, I think as a student it makes a difference, and people look at that because they're saying, okay, how active are you? How involved in the profession are you? How many conferences uh, in your capacity and your role as a student have you participated in? I think that's a very good point. I think it depends on where you are in your career. When you're first starting out, of course, conferences, invited papers, um, book reviews, manuscripts that you're currently working on, all of that matters. It depends on how far along you are. At some point, I don't know, maybe my, I don't remember, but maybe my early Vitas did have these kinds of things. First of all, now I, I don't keep track. It, it just becomes too time consuming to worry about those things. I can barely keep track, literally, of, of where I am in my writing to, to not worry about the other thing. As a student, as a person just starting out, it makes it's different. You're absolutely right. Oh, sorry. Obviously, being published is the best solution. If you do end up with uh, review and, and resubmit type situation, what's the best way to capitalize? Okay. Um, I, we published a piece on this, and I think it, it's really important. If you get an R&R, &R, this is true for ASR, but I think it's even more true for the other journals, your chance of getting published is 50% and higher. So that once you're in the system, stay with it. Try and, and meet the reviewers or the editors' um, uh, comments, uh, recommendations for a change, etc. I mean, if they're reasonable. Sometimes they're not reasonable. And say so when you're working on the manuscript and you're responding and say, look, that means really doing another study or something like that. But if you get a, a revised recommendation for revision and resubmission, take it seriously and send it back to that initial journal. Is that what you meant? That's exactly right. Send it back there. Don't start all over again because R&Rs uh, have a much, much higher percentage of getting published than any fresh submission. Over 50%. That was what we found uh, for ASR. And we looked it over across two editors' time periods. 50% um, and higher was the, uh, the figure there. And that's just much better than starting out uh, clean, even with a, a relatively low prestige folks. Yeah. Do you normally have to remind them that they, they know, the they know, they know, <coughs> they know, yeah. You say it in a couple of letters, here's my revisions, etc., but they know, absolutely. In fact, there, there have been times when I have sent out an enormous number of articles, R, R and R, because very rarely do you get a manuscript that you accept right, right off the bat. 
very, very small percent. If I know that I that there's something good in the works, I occasionally would call an author and say, how's it coming? We're very interested. I didn't think that was about it. I mean, it was up to him or her to then decide whether she wanted to send it back to us. But um, if you get an R&R, I would stay with that journal. This is a very good question. Yes, yeah, one other question. I guess at, at no other time has academia been under siege from the general public and, and you know, from <coughs> some, some individuals on, on the concept of, of, of publishing credits. You know, since you know, there's a book that's come out of the the, si- the si- Yeah, the Sykes book. Yeah, and then there's Al Bennett, of course, you know, yeah. maybe we're wasting a lot of the time yeah. on publishing a lot of things. You know, from your perspective, both as authors and academician and, 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 and then how do you see that there? Are those criticisms valid? Are we, in fact, wasting a lot of time in publishing? Or, you know, how do you see that? Well, first of all, I think it's not the first time that uh, we, we that academia has received these criticisms. I don't. It's a bit more intense, though, than some other time. Well, I don't remember from personal experience because even I am not that old. But certainly during the 1930s, there was a lot of criticism that the professors have a very soft life, and uh, um, a lot of what they write about is of absolutely no use, and so forth. And I think then during the age of relevancy, we all no, we don't. Know but during the late 60s and 70s when being relevant was the most important thing. A lot of people that were working on more abstract and perhaps more theoretical pieces were under severe attack. Now we're going through another kind of thing that what we're doing is unimportant. A lot of it is unimportant and trivial. In my experience as editor, and I've also been series editors for um, uh, book uh, publishers and so forth, there's an awful lot of stuff that really isn't worth anyone spending their time on that that is being uh, submitted for uh, publication, that there's an awful lot of utterly trivial, unimportant kinds of things that if people devoted their times to other things that would be much better spent. Um, I, I think that um, that we are so caught up in in trying to get things out that very often we lose. I mean, Max Weber was, I think, right on target when he said, one of the most important things we do as a social scientist is to pick the problem that we want to work on, to pick the topic. And I think knowing what's an important problem from what's a trivial problem, knowing a problem that, one, we have some expertise on versus something that, well, as a public citizen, we feel strongly about, are important distinctions that we ought to to be able to make for ourselves. I think a lot of us don't. And I think a lot of us do work on things that probably aren't worth our time, our students' time, editors' time, and so forth. Whether it's worse today than at any earlier time, maybe so, because there's so many more journals. Every time you turn around, uh, there's a new journal. Uh, the, the outlets for um, work in, in the social sciences, not only criminal justice, although they are too, the number of journals has... I think increased a great deal is much much greater, and therefore the temptations to say, "Well, I'll simply go down the list, and um, uh, one of these journals will take it," because editors have problems sometimes in filling uh, their pages. As as a rejected author, you don't think that's ever possible, but believe me, it is. And uh, so, yeah, a lot of stuff gets published that's really not worth it. And I think one of the things that and what it tell our students is publishing just for the sake of filling journal pages is, I don't think, a terribly respectable way to run one's, one's professional life. I, I know that that sounds harsh and so forth, but I think there's an awful lot of junk that sees the light of day. And I can tell you from the point of view of editor, an editor who who rejected 90% of the manuscripts in both journals, there's an awful lot of it that really wasn't even worth a reviewer's time on. So I sent them out because I felt I wanted to give everyone the benefit of the doubt. Yes? Uh, continue that point. Do you think that these universities that require specific amount of publishing per year I think that's crazy. Yes, I do. I think that's crazy. 
I think that unless you look at quality, and I know it's very difficult to arrive at consensus about measures of quality. It's much easier to just count. Um, but I think to, to have these rules, I know, for example, at Hebrew University, not only in some departments do they have numbers, but the number of articles in English-speaking journals versus the number of articles in Hebrew journals, uh, the number of articles in these kinds of journals versus the others. It used to become an extraordinarily complex set of uh, formulas that one had to use. And that's certainly true in American uh, universities and departments. I think that's, that's a mistake. That's all part of this business. Well, how do we count a textbook? And how do we count a book review? And how do we count an invited uh, article? And how do we count a chapter in a reader? And so on. I don't know. Absolutely. 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 And I think that kind of honesty and explicitness about what you're all about is important. There's no, I think there's nothing wrong with writing. A, in fact, I think there's much to commend it. Write a good text. You may make a lot of money on it, but writing a good text and, and having uh, students use that in introductory courses, I think it is an enormously valuable contribution. Yet you get some departments that say, oh, textbook writing. Just hack work. I disagree completely. I'm terrified at writing a text. If you look at my read, I've never written a text in my life. I probably won't. Just as I thought teaching an introductory course was the hardest kind of teaching, I think writing a good text is very difficult. And uh, I would in no way uh, demean it. And yet, in these ranking systems, texts are often either not counted or all, sometimes they're held uh, as, a, as a negative. But I think if you know what you're about, and you say, this is the kind of work I want to do, these are the kinds of people I want to reach, these are the kinds of problems I'm interested in solving, it's very, very helpful. In, in terms of my own career, I don't know that I've always been successful, probably haven't. I've, I've said to myself, I want to work on problems that matter. I want to work on problems that might make a difference in terms of policy, in terms of how well people live, in terms of things that are good for the society. My stuff on the jury um, came out of a, a belief that I thought the jury was a very good institution, and I wanted to see it perpetuated. And at the time we were working on it, way back at the University of Chicago, the jury was under attack. It was under attack particularly from the appellate bench that wanted to follow the British system of doing away with the jury, certainly in civil actions, maybe keeping it for criminal. So a lot of my stuff on the jury, in fact, after I just served on a jury, uh, my first one a few weeks ago, I wrote a, a piece to the local newspaper saying, it's everything I thought it would be. Um, my stuff on transracial adoption talks about cultural identity, racial awareness, racial attitudes. I did that uh, during a period when all hell was breaking loose on the civil rights movement. I was chair of the sociology department at Illinois. We'd have confrontations every day, and I said to myself, as a sociologist, is there anything I can do, any kind of work that I could do that might shed some light on prejudice, on how people acquire racial attitudes, awareness? And I remembered that I knew some people white families who had adopted black children. I said, what goes on in those families? How do people treat each other? How do they relate to each other? If you are the mother of a black child, what does it do to your own racial identity? If you are the sister of a, a Korean or an American Indian child, how do you see yourself? Well, I started working on transracial adoption, not because I was at all interested in adoption. I'm still not. But uh, in, since 1972, when our third book came out a few years ago, we have followed families because we were interested in cultural identity, in racial awareness, in the development of attitudes about race. And I thought that was a very useful way of finding out about things like that. And that was my sole interest. I'm not a clinician and I'm not a social worker. Uh, my colleague who I picked up after I had done the first set of studies is a professor of social work and so he keeps me straight and honest about all the social work implications of the stuff but I'm interested in cultural identity and racial awareness and that's where, where my stuff on transracial adoption comes from um, my work on immigration I have a position on 
what I think U.S. immigration policy should be. I'm in favor of allowing many more immigrants into this country than we have ever admitted uh, since the quota acts of the 1920s. And much of my work on the adjustment and the contribution that immigrants make support that view. Um, so in my own career, I have tried to pick problems that I think are important. I've stayed away from issues that I think are, in my view, and it's a biased view, that are parochial or that uh, are just a more narrow interest. Those are decisions that everybody makes. But I think you ought to sit down when you're a graduate student and try and say, what kind of professional writing do I want to do? And if you're lucky and can stick with it, I think that's a good thing. Sometimes you're career-driven, right? and I do understand about that. From yes. a further perspective, how much emphasis can you place on having doctoral students publish during the course of them completing their studies? I think it's very important. I have, again, in, in my own professional career, I not only do I publish with doctoral students, I've published with undergraduates. When I have a really bright undergraduate, usually I admit he or she is a junior or a senior, although I published with my son when he was a high school student. We did a survey of uh, interracial friendships and, and published the piece when he was in uh, first year of high school. But I publish with undergraduates as well. If they come to me very often in my undergraduate classes, I will have students do papers. And if I, they come to me and say, well, I'm sort of interested in such and such, or if they say to me, could I work on something that you're working on, and we figure out a specific problem, if I think the stuff is good or shows promise, I will then work with it, and uh, such papers have been published. Um, but I always publish with my graduate students. I think it, it's useful for their own development. I think they learn a lot about what it, it what are the stages that are involved, and I think it's important in terms of their first draft. Sometimes their name even goes first, depending on, on who picked the problem and so on. Yes? Um, to kind of tie with Rick's question, where would you um, place, you know, obviously it's beneficial for a uh, doctoral student or you know, a graduate student to publish with a faculty member or with some other you know, distinguished person. Is it worthwhile for, for students to, to collaborate with them? Sure, absolutely. Absolutely. And also to publish. Only with your name on it, absolutely. On, on the matter of whether it, it biases you, your, the question that early on, uh, as I say, in your field, most likely the manuscript will go out anonymously. Now you might want to show it to some uh, more experienced people to get advice beforehand. But yeah, publish on your own. Why not? I think it's, it's look. We all know that a lot of the stuff that's jointly published, people will look and say he or she did all that work with his or her senior professor, how much of it is really his or hers. We do that all the time when you look at manuscripts. Or if, if somebody has a vita in which every single manuscript has three or four authors. Now, if you're a Nobel Prize kind, if you're Milton Friedman or Hayek or someone like that, you may have three or four authors, but most people assume, maybe wrongly, that Friedman or Hayek or Merton or, or uh, Short or so on were the driving force behind it. But if you are not so eminent and your vita shows only multiple uh, names on every publication, three, four, etc., that's not as good. Now here we're really getting down to the fine details of uh, how do you read vita and, and what it'll do for you. But obviously it's, you need to have some things that you've done alone until you're sufficiently senior that it doesn't matter. When you're sufficiently senior, then it doesn't matter because, rightly or wrongly, people give you the benefit of the doubt that you are, in fact, the senior person. Um, but if you're starting out, try and do things on your own. Now, obviously, getting published is more important than not, so you do it with your thesis uh, faculty member or some other people. But in addition, think about publishing with another student for whom then you can say in the article uh, the name order is simply alphabetical. It, it doesn't mean that any one person was more important. And best of all, try and publish on your own. And again, that goes to where you publish. 
Uh, again, it's a it's a it's a subjective call as to whether publishing with a uh, senior prof- professor in a leading journal is more prestigious than publishing on your own in less. Now, in terms of people, quickly, visibility, name recall, etc., even being the second, maybe even the third author, although it gets tricky there, in the uh, lead journal, may be more important. But you can't make a career of that. Not a prestigious career, I don't think. I hate using terms like prestige and so forth because they seem so empty and calculating. I'm really trying to say whether it's it's a career that you're proud of, that you're that you can look yourself in the mirror and say, "Yeah, this is what I want to do. This is where I want to be." And sometimes that can be hard for people. Is that a good that, or do you want to shift to the other front? Any other comments? Yeah, we that in the airport, I guess. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> and we're not finished. <laughs> right. Right. Well, okay. Not that that's not an important issue, mind you, but we'll leave you. Okay. Okay. Um, When I wrote my book on women in crime, uh, the way I I think it's interesting, the way I I came about to write it, um, I had never written a book in criminology before. Uh, My work had all been in the sociology of law up until that time. And uh, the people in NIMH, in the crime and delinquency section, I had served on their review panel. And not Celine, but someone who was working with Celine Shaw at that time, uh, called me and said, nobody has ever done a monograph on women in crime. Would you do it? And I said, you know, that's true. Isn't that interesting? Do women commit crimes? What kind of crimes? Are now, I know this seems like 100 years ago, but this was... Um, in the early 70s. And in fact, Frida Adler was working on her book, Sisters in Crime, at that time, but we didn't know that we were working on the same topic. And as you know, her book, Sisters in Crime, is a very different treatment of the topic than mine is. Hers is a uh, non-data-driven analysis of the problem. And we we learned that that we were both working on the same general topic, I think, shortly before publication of both, but they came out about the same. Um, so I, I had never given a thought to the topic women in crime um, I had no idea of what kind of data sources there were or anything about it but NINH said we think it's an important issue and we think the time has come to do something now Pollock had written his book about uh, women who commit uh, crimes of violence you know Pollock 1950 University of Pennsylvania and he, he talked about women who find themselves in situations in which they're caring for elderly, wealthy people or their um, secretaries to uh, uh, influential and important uh, executives or their nurses or what have you. And he made the point that given women who occupy these kinds of roles, they make excellent covers for committing uh, acts of violence in which there's personal gain involved. And he said, in fact, the number of women who are caught at it is really a tiny, tiny proportion. He didn't know how many, obviously, compared to the number of women who, in fact, use that role to commit uh, uh, crimes of violence. The woman who marries four or five uh, wealthy men and all of them die mysteriously. There's a case now in uh, one of the southern South Carolina, I think, of a woman, a... a, uh, leading citizen in the community who apparently her father died and turns out that he had poisoned his system and several husbands and a lover, etc. And she's now being, uh, her case is being investigated. She is the, she's been charged with uh, murder in these various cases. Well, okay, so there was that kind of work done, but that's, that certainly doesn't look at the whole 
area of women and uh, propensity to commit crime. And there were a few other things uh, done, but on the whole, practically nothing. And so I said, wow. And uh, I started, I know this sounds extraordinary, but at least give me the benefit. It was almost 20 years ago and so on. I didn't even know about the FBI, the kinds of data that were available from the FBI. And then when I started looking at it, I said, isn't this extraordinary that you can look at things by race and types of offenses, by race and age and types of offenses, but you can't look at anything by race and sex. They simply don't make the breaks this way. And uh, all kinds of other difficulties with the FBI data, but it became clear that if you wanted to say something on a national basis and didn't want to go out and collect your own data, everybody was using the FBI data. And then my biggest shock came when I tried to look at court data, and I found that, in fact, there's no national archive where all state court um, uh, statistics are available and so forth, so that unlike uh, England or unlike most of the European countries, if you want to see how uh, the states uh, treat defendants, you've got to do it on a state-by-state -state basis. Now, LEAA try to help and try to um, get the states, this is later on, to uh, provide and keep long-term uh, data broken by um, various demographic characteristics and so forth. But I found that when I started working on the book that one of my biggest problems was finding reliable and useful data sources. Data sources that would allow me to generalize to the country as a whole, data sources that would allow me to go back in time and make some generalizations and so forth. And believe it or not, there wasn't much that was available. Uh, now, that has, a lot of that has changed. What has changed mostly is the number of studies that have been done on women in crime, the number of books that have been written. I mean, they would now fill libraries. There has been an enormous <coughs> outbreak. Any uh, issue in which women are in any way involved has become one of the hottest things. I keep thinking that we're finally going to reach the ceiling and, and we're going to stop uh, seeing uh, such a prodigious output, but I don't think we've reached that yet. The amount of work that's done on women in every aspect of, of their lives, I think, is enormous. I'm not sure put into it. I'm not sure that all that writing and research needs to be done. I'm not sure that all that much light is now shed on these topics. I think some of the stuff is just repetitious and goes on and on the same thing. It's ideologically driven rather than data driven and so forth. I just published a piece in Public Opinion Quarterly with a doctoral student in which I look at leading women's issues, ERA, abortion, uh, equal pay, not comparable pay, because we didn't see any stuff on that yet, but equal pay and all kinds of things. And lo and behold, what do we find? That men are more supportive, or as supportive, but in many instances, more supportive of those issues than these are rank and file men than are rank and file women. Um, so I, I wonder at this prodigious amount of literature which paints women as victims. I, I do have some trouble with that. Okay, back to women in crime. When I started uh, working on this, um, there was nothing, or practically nothing, done on it, and a lot of the time was spent looking at data sources. The more I looked, and the more I tried to examine patterns uh, in the arrest area, particularly, uh, it came, it was pretty clear that uh, women were much more likely to commit property offenses than they were to commit crimes against the person, uh, and that within the property area, that they had some greater propensities to commit larceny, embezzlement, fraud, than they did to commit um, auto theft, burglary, and some other kinds of property offenses. And so I looked at the data, and the data were quite clear. For example, if you look at, um, uh, you know this stuff better than I just by now, if you look at women's propensity to commit violent crimes, that is, the proportion of women who are arrested for the type 1, you all, you're all experts in this more than I. You all know the type 1 offenses and all that, right? Okay. If you look at women's propensity to commit the type 1 violent offenses in 1953, 11.9% of all such arrests were women. In 1987, guess what percentage are women, roughly? 11.1%. Okay. Uh, 
so all this concern that women are becoming more violent, more aggressive, etc. Now remember, I'm talking about adult women, and I, uh, I suppose we, there's some thinking one should look at juveniles differently and so on. But anyway, and the range is in fact um, 13.5 in the period from 53 to 87 is the highest uh, percentage of women who are arrested for type 1 violent offenses occurred in 1956, long before uh, the, women's, the contemporary women's movement and long before the, uh, the decade of um, uh, social unrest, etc. If you look at prop- the type 1 property offenses, you find that um, in 1953, women, uh, uh, eight, 8.5% of all such arrests were women. What's your guess about where we are in 87? about 25 percent, 24 percent. So that there has been a noticeable increase in the amount of um, property crimes that women are arrested for. Um, And it's been steady. That is, there hasn't been, you know, it hasn't been up and down and it hasn't been a sharp jump. Is it just because there's more crime reporting it has to be given to the Gavin more crime statistics now? But wouldn't it, but wouldn't it, wouldn't, if in fact there was more crime, wouldn't you see a big increase in violent crime because aren't people much, aren't police much more likely to make the arrest in the violent crime, and especially the type 1 violent crimes? And so therefore, if in fact this was simply a reflection of better police work, I think you'd see it more in the violent and more propensity for police to pick up women. I think you'd see it in the violent more. I have the raw data. I simply haven't bought it. Otherwise, I'd simply read to you the, the numbers. Um, I, my hunch is that if you look at the difference between women's propensity to commit violent offenses and women's propensity to commit property as reflected by arrest data, and then you also look more carefully at the kinds of property offenses that they're arrested for, that it is not an artifact simply of more crime, but it's an artifact, it's the result of something else. I know that people disagree with me about it, but the more I look at the data, the more sure I am that I'm right. That may be self-serving. And that is, it's a function of other things that are happening in women's lives. And as I look, and for example, in the federal data, do you know that of all the people that are arrested in the federal courts for embezzlement, guess what percent are women these days from the mid-80s on? This is federal court data all over the country. It's about 50%. And I, I'm really delighted because in my book, one of the things that I, I, I said, I reluctant to forecast, I said, if in fact we see more women in the labor forces, we see more women, uh, particularly in the kind of work that they do, what we're going to see is women being represented in certain kinds of property offenses at about the same rate that they're represented in the population as a whole. And embezzlement... I, I, for all the people that say to me, you've got it all wrong, Rita, it's really women as victims and it's these poor women who are committing all these crimes, embezzlement simply doesn't fit that picture. Kathleen, Kathleen Daly, who is a very, very uh, good uh, young criminologist, and, and she disagrees with me, basically. She really uh, sees women as victims and so forth. But she had, in one federal jurisdiction, she was able to collect demographic data about the men and women who are involved in these various kinds of offenses. And so she has occupation, but I have the paper here, she has occupation and she has um, uh, age and marital status and all that. And she looks at the women across these various crimes and lo and behold she finds that what kinds of women embezzle? It's women who are working in banks, it's women who are working in various other kinds of institutions, it's women who have had more than a high school education, etc. Now, how much are women embezzling? One of the things that I say in the 70s, and I I will say it now, is sure, they're not embezzling hundreds of thousands of dollars, but why not? Not because they're better or purer or more noble than the men. If you have to be a, a vice president or maybe a president to have access to that kind of money. If you're a teller, you do the best you can. And that means 10,000 less than that. And that's what the data she, for that one jurisdiction, show. I can't, because I'm looking at secondary analysis, unfortunately I can't show you the amount. 
uh, I, I've gone and interviewed judges and we've talked with some women offenders and I have the feeling that the amount that women uh, defendants are embezzling has gone up from uh, the 70s. But what is absolutely clear is that the kinds of offenses that women are most likely to commit fit the pattern, I allege, of women who are in the labor force. Now, what kind of work, even now, even today, um, what kind of work do most people in the labor force do? They do administrative, clerical, secretarial, bookkeeping kinds of things. That means you have access to other people's goods or money, right? If you're a, a buyer in a department store or something like that. And the kinds of property offenses that women are most likely to commit fit that pattern. Yes, I know that women on welfare commit uh, welfare check frauds. I know that uh, the shoplifting is very often done by the unwed mother who has three children at home. I'm not indifferent to that. I know that. But if you look at the overall pattern, more and more women are in the labor force. More and more women are in the kinds of jobs that lend themselves to these uh, patterns. And if you look at the increase in uh, the kinds of property offenses, and embezzlement, I think, is not unimportant or insignificant. I think it fits the opportunity structure. That doesn't mean that I'm not in, unaware of the, the other kinds of cases. The other thing is, if you look at the violent offenses, um, who are the kinds of people that women have traditionally killed or maimed or hurt? Their husbands, their lovers, their pimps, and their unborn or newly born babies. And what happens is, with, uh, we'll see what happens, but with changes in the abortion situation, certainly in the 70s and much of the 80s, and with women's greater opportunities to earn their own living and to support themselves, they are no longer under the power uh, of people, of, of men who make them do things that they don't like or who abuse them over years and then finally the woman when the guy is drunk or asleep or something kills them and they have other options about doing away with fetus or babies that they don't want. So the major targets uh, for women's violence have been dissipated, I argue, and for whatever you may say about my argument, at least the fact is that in 1953, uh, less than 12% of all violent arrests were women. In 1987, less than 12%, and there's very little in between that. Women, we also know, are rarely involved in felony murders. They're rarely involved in um, um, homicides that involve uh, uh, theft and, and stuff like that. I'm sorry, what, what I'm thinking is, you were saying increase in property crime is women basically not so much due to a, a deprivation factor, but simply uh, opportunity to provide Opportunity. I don't talk about bravado. Frida Adler talks about bravado. I don't know anything about bravado. I don't know how to measure bravado. I look at opportunity. And yes, I do. I said that earlier, and then uh, people said, but wait, 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 look at the data. And I confess that a lot of the data I look at support that. And that doesn't mean that I'm not also, I look, and what data am I looking at? Okay, I'm looking at the, the arrest data, I'm looking at the, the court data, I'm also looking at demographic data. So you look at um, women in the labor force and what, over 60% uh, of married women with children are in the labor force full time. I also am looking at the increase in single-headed female households. And I know that, and I know that many of those households um, are either at the poverty level or below, and so they're the temptations to take shortcuts and commit uh, criminal acts are very great, and I know that a lot of the shoplifting, and that gets under loss and theft, and a lot of uh, uh, fraud and maybe forgery of welfare checks are part of those women, and I don't say that that's part of opportunity. I understand that it's not a single driven theory. But I'm saying that all those people who argue that none of it is opportunity, that none of it is the result of women in the labor force and the kind of work they do, etc., I think are allowing beliefs, values, ideology to interfere with what the data show.
and I'm going to say that in my revised version as well. It will not be popularly received by a lot of people. I, I understand that. So, so what about the, uh, the number of women arrested, let's say, you know, when I was what is the ratio of women arrested to like prostitution type crime as opposed to large Okay, I looked at that. Uh, among the, obviously, most, even today, although certainly there have been changes, most prostitutes are women. And uh, in 1987, 65%, 64.8% of all persons arrested for prostitution and commercialized vice. And you probably know more about what commercialized vice is than I do. But they were women. In 1953, 73% of those persons arrested were women. Um, now, we've gone up and down on that, uh, so that in the 70s, the percent who were arrested in that category were uh, even higher who were women. We had a high of... 79.5%. But most of the people who are arrested for prostitution are still women, although I understand that there is now a, a pretty um, general male prostitution. And most, okay. most of the women. Um, here, I'm looking at those data now. Um, yes. Not by much, but or fraud. Um, in, 19, oh, oh. in 1987, of all the women who were arrested, so now we're looking at, we're breaking the cohort differently, 3.4% were arrested for prostitution and 6.4% were arrested for uh, fraud. You know, they broke embezzlement and fraud. Uh, they separated that in the 70s. So that um, um, fraud is, among the women arrested, fraud is the... Uh, most uh, common category. No, like the, uh, yes, wait a minute. Now let me get the type one offenses broken that way too. Uh, okay. Um, oh no, larceny and theft. Of all the women, of, of all the kinds of crimes, 20% of female arrests are for larceny and theft. In fact, I have another table that says what what's the profile, the the most frequently uh, cited crimes. And I look at 1972, 1980, 1987, and let's compare. First, let's compare women over time. Then we can compare men and women. In 1972, here was what the profile was of all female arrests. 20% were for larceny and theft, 9.8% for drunkenness, 8.5% disorderly conduct, 6% drug laws, 4.1% assaults, 3.8% drunken driving, 3.4% prostitution, 2.7% uh, violation of liquor laws, 2.4% embezzlement and fraud, 2% aggravated assault. That was the woman's profile in 1972. Then I have it in 80, but let's go to 87. Um, 20.4% loss in the theft. So over the 15-year uh, period, it's still, if you want to characterize who is the female offender, one out of five of the female offenders has committed larceny and theft. And that involves shoplifting, that involves all kinds of things. Okay, and then it went to drunken driving, and then it went to fraud. And that fraud didn't appear on the list in 1972. I argue that is consistent with my notions about what's happening. And then it went to drug abuse, disorderly conduct. Prostitution is down there, it's still at 3.4%, but others, um, there were others that went up higher. Okay? That's the woman. All right, what does the man look like? 1972, of all the, of all the arrests of men all over the country, what was the most frequent arrest? Come on, all you experts. What? Drunkenness. 22.9%, 1972, then drunken driving, then disorderly conduct, then larceny and theft, then narcotics, burglary, other assaults, liquor laws, aggravated assault, robbery. Now, when I gave you that profile, that accounts for about 70% of all the arrests for all women and for all men. Uh, if you look at 1987, 
what are men most likely to be arrested for? Remember, it was larceny and theft for women, and that accounted for one out of five of the women. For men, the most frequent arrest in 1987 is drunken driving at 14%, larceny and theft at 9.7%. So whereas a little less than one in 10 of the men who are arrested are arrested for, for larceny, one in five of the women are. Then drug abuse, drunkenness, other assaults, disorderly conduct, burglary at 3.9, aggravated assault, and vandalism. And I think that, that's a kind of interesting picture of where we are on crimes and what, what women are doing. And the big increases, the dramatic increases over time, has not been in sort of the traditional female roles of uh, um, prostitution or um, uh, crimes against the family. I have that as an area. That hasn't gone up. Offenses against family and children, that hasn't gone up over, over the years. But it's, I would say, more in crimes of opportunity. Yes. I'm wondering how many crimes that burglary, and forgery, or okay, I, right, and, and that, of course, is very, that I, I look <coughs> at when I look at the court data, uh, and I still think you, certainly on the embezzlement things, those are not, apparently not drug related. Uh, and I would, I think as I looked at some of those data, it's hard to tease out uh, many of the, the property offenses are not. Now, of course, the prostitution must be. As a probation officer, I see a lot of them they come into a burglary of a habitation, but when you get right down to it, they're supporting sure. a habit or whatever. Right. Yes. Yes. And now, of course, with the crack problem, <coughs> it has become much greater. Yes. And would it be greater among women than among men? I don't know. I don't know. All right. Well, then what, I was, what I'm looking at is I'm tracing arrest patterns. Now, I understand you know better even than I, that arrest may be the tip of the iceberg, that all the types of offenses for which um, uh, the police are called or, or uh, things that have happened for which there are no arrests. But unfortunately, we can't attach a male or a female uh, characteristic to those things because we, they're just crimes that are known to the police. So we all, for all the weaknesses, we all deal with the same set of data even though what, 40% of all robberies are cleared by arrest or uh, other kinds of offenses may be even lower. Obviously, homicide is much higher. Uh, nevertheless, we're all looking at the same data. We're all looking at arrest data, and the pattern is absolutely clear that homicide and crimes of violence generally have either stayed the same or gone slightly down for women, and the property offenses, particularly the serious property offenses, have gone up, and they've gone up in significant amounts uh, from the uh, late 60s on. Now, what also happened from the late 60s on is you've had a much higher percentage of women in the labor force, and I would argue, and I wish that we can get the data on more than just a, a jurisdiction by jurisdiction basis, that in fact, if you look at the amount of money that's involved and the amount of, of theft that's involved, uh, it, it will, it will get, get Larger, larger, and larger, larger as women, as women assume, assume the position of greater important. importance. Okay. As I said, yeah. if you are the buyer, you can steal more than the assistant buyer. If you are the vice president, you obviously can steal much more than if you are the assistant bookkeeper and so forth. We do see, and I, I map that in terms of you know the census data and the other kinds of occupational data, about changes in women's positions within that, quote, secretarial administrative support thing, professional jobs, etc. And you do see a shift there. You do see women moving up into these higher positions. Uh, and you do see, and I think that goes hand in hand with the kinds of criminal acts that women um, engage in. Now, you see, that takes me totally out of, of that whole debate about are women more honorable or less honorable than men? Are they more victims than non-victims? Are they uh, better people than... I, I'm a sociologist. I'm not a philosopher. I'm not a theologian. And therefore, I try to look at these things and make sense of the overall pattern, and that's where I come out. Um, I, I don't... I think... We're running out of time on this, although we can talk about this in the afternoon. I'd, I'd like to say a few things about the courts, but let me jump for a minute to the, the prison uh, situation. One of the things that was very... First of all, women make up what percent of all the prison inmates, state and federal. So we all know what we're talking about. Hello? 
much less than 10, between 4 and 5 percent. Okay, that's state and federal. I've got the data here. We can look at it. But that's what it is. So let's remember that they are less than 1 in 20 of all the, uh, the people in prison. Nevertheless, what was absolutely clear to people who were looking at women in prison um, 20 years ago and, and today, in fact, I call my chapter in the earlier version, I'll probably rename it the Forgotten Offender, because one, there were so few women generally in prison, and generally women were more docile prisoners than men. It was much rarer for a riot to occur in a woman's prison than in a men's prison. They uh, behaved better in prison, etc. What was also clear, however, was that uh, the kinds of programs that were available for women in prisons uh, in two decades ago and um, in earlier periods was much, much more limited. Now, one can argue, but there's so few of them, it, it's just too expensive to, to introduce the same kinds of programs. I'm talking about academic programs, getting uh, the equivalent of a high school diploma or even um, literacy uh, uh, opportunities. I'm talking about vocational opportunities. One of the big ironies, not very long ago, is one of the major uh, vocations that women could acquire in prison was cosmetology. The only problem with that is that if you're a convicted felon, you then can't practice uh, when you get out. So all the stuff they're learning about uh, uh, hair and makeup, etc., uh, wouldn't wouldn't help them earn a living. Okay. In addition to that, there were very few opportunities for earning any money, business opportunities, job opportunities in the prison compared to men. Now, this I wasn't deriving this data. This appeared in the Yale Law Journal article, Aridite, and, and some others were working on this. And, and other people had made a great many complaints about that. That has changed enormously in 20 years. I'm not saying the situation is ideal, but compared to what? We did a survey for this... Um, volume that I'm hoping will be out within the year, in which we surveyed all of the women's prisons, state and federal, and we set, we gave them a checklist of all the various kinds of vocational programs that might be available, employment opportunities, etc., for men and for women in prison, and there there have been important changes. You now find that the opportunities that women have to learn um, various vocations in prison has increased enormously and their opportunities for jobs as data to earn money data pro doing data processing or doing various kinds of bookkeeping or um, uh, some making furniture all kinds of things I have the list here and so on that has increased enormously also just the straight academic programs have been introduced in women's prisons and I'm in no way saying it's ideal maybe it isn't even good enough but the discrepancy between uh, what's available in men's prisons and women's prisons has changed a great deal in uh, the past uh, 15 or 20 years. In addition to that, one of the other major complaints that people had on, on women are the facilities that were available for them vis-a-vis uh, -vis their children. Um, then and now, most of the women in prison are mothers of young children. And the question is, um, how, can they, how much time can they spend with their children when the children come to visit? Uh, what, what kind of time can they spend with them? What are the opportunities for being alone with the children, for perhaps spending a weekend, or how often can the children come, what kind of facilities? And that's changed a lot, too. And again, we have data on that. In practically every woman's prison today, there are special facilities whereby um, uh, women can... Uh, uh, spend a day or a weekend with their child, there are uh, sleeping facilities, there are uh, cooking facilities, there are playroom facilities, etc. And, and that has made an important difference. It also used to be that um, women were under enormous pressure if they gave birth when they were in prison. They were uh, sent to prison while they were still pregnant, and if they gave birth in prison, to give their child up for adoption, to sign the papers, etc. There was always that lovely couple that was waiting to take the baby. Now um, that pressure has pretty much disappeared. Many women do give their babies up for adoption. Uh, if they're in prison, they see no way of supporting them. They, they don't have uh, a husband or close relatives who can take care of the baby and so on. But the, the explicit taking advantage, if you like, of women who are in prison and uh, uh, the pressure put on them to sign the adoption papers, that, that no longer happens either. So 
among the women in prison, and I'm in no way saying it's a good place for them to be and we ought to send more of them there. I'm not saying any of those things. For those who are there, conditions have become somewhat better. And on topics and on problems that they consider important. Okay?